good afternoon and a welcome to you all to today's online debate organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance. The topic today is assessing the preliminary impact of COVID-19 on the banking sector in Europe. I think the title is quite self-explanatory of what we will be discussing. So my name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of Bocconi at Bocconi, a professor of finance sorry, at Bocconi University, and I will be chairing today's seminar and debate. So let me introduce the speaker in order in which they will talk. So we have Mario Quagliarello, who is the director of economic analysis and statistics at the European Banking Authority. Then we have Veronica Ormezzano, who is the head of group prudential affairs at BNP Paribas. We have, if it comes on the screen, Thierry Schulman, who is a partner and co-head of Oliver Wyman Risk and Public Policy Practice in the Americas, and he's based in California, so I hope he has not fallen asleep in the meantime again. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Nicola Veron, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and at Bruegel. So thank you again to all of you for participating today and we look forward to the debate. So as said, the title is quite self-explanatory. So the debate will start with Mario telling us the findings of the EBA assessment of the health or state of health of the European banking sector, in particular in terms of the resilience of the sector. And then we will uh, move with Veronique to listen to the views of the private sector on how the banking sector is, whether he's, it's effectively so healthy as it may appear in the first sight. And then we will have Till, hoping that he will be with us again by then, that he will instead bring us to the US and will talk us through the stress test that the Fed has just finished. And then we will have a discussion on the effectiveness or diagnostic tools in times of uncertainty as the one we are currently experiencing. And finally, we will move with Nicola with a more general view, let me say a more free view of the situation. So Mario goes first, as I said, and I remind you of the timing. Mario has maximum 12 minutes. All the other commentators will have at max seven minutes. Then as usual, we will start with the Q&A. So the participants, please feel free to um, pose your question along the webinar. Please use the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of the screen and not the chat box. I always say that, but please stick to that if you can so that we can collect the questions more effectively. Try to ask brief questions. If you want, it would be uh, helpful if you could indicate the person uh, to whom the question is uh, particularly addressed, if that's the case that you have a particular person you would like to ask the question to. So with that, I don't want to steal any other time that given that we are many speakers today. So Mario, the floor is yours for your remarks. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. I'm sharing the slides. I hope you can uh, uh, see them now. Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, and thanks to Elena and the Florence School of Banking and Finance for having me today at this, uh, at this webinar. So the purpose of my presentation is uh, on the one hand to give you an overview of what we did in our, let's say, impact assessment uh, of, the, of, the, of the crisis, which is of course a very preliminary assessment based on uh, still uh, 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 partial information. And also I will have a couple of uh, thoughts uh, for the other panelists on the use of, let's say, vulnerability analysis, stress test sensitivities uh, in, a crisis, uh, uh, in a crisis situation. So I think uh, is, uh, this slide is, uh, let's say, uh, obvious introduction uh, to, the, to the topic. We have seen uh, since the beginning of the pandemic in Europe uh, a deterioration, a steady deterioration of business confidence. And also if you look at the uh, gradual release of the GDP forecast, they've been uh, more and more uh, pessimistic. So at the beginning, the idea was to have a uh, probably very huge impact uh, this year, but then a quick recovery, while uh, new estimates tend to be less uh, positive in that, uh, in that respect. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of the sectors, uh, while some of them can to some extent benefit from the, from the pandemics, uh, most of them will be heavily affected in a, in a negative way, especially tourism, transport and others. And of course, this has been reflected in the general uh, 
uh, behavior of stock prices, but especially on the valuation of banks, which of course uh, are uh, exposed towards uh, uh, some some of those of those of those of those sectors. Now we started our analysis with what uh, we knew. So these are, let's say, uh, facts that we can uh, put on the table, which is that the starting point uh, uh, for the banking sector is much better than it used to be at the start of the great financial crisis. Uh, first of all, in terms of liquidity, all banks have uh, very ample liquidity buffers. The liquidity coverage ratio was at 150% in December 2019. Just again, as a reminder, let's say the prescribed uh, value is 100% uh, and it is a buffer. So also in this case can potentially go below 100%. Uh, also, the funding position of the banks uh, was more solid than in the past, uh, with a very uh, solid uh, deposit base, uh, and also banks, uh, let's say, front-loading of the funding needs, uh, also thanks to the um, good conditions in, uh, uh, in the market in uh, 2019 and still uh, in early 2020. And then, of course, at, uh, uh, once this, the crisis started with a uh, uh, significant take-up of the central bank uh, facilities. Um, Capital buffers are uh, uh, very, very high. The CT1 ratio is on average 15%. But I think what is more interesting is that we have seen uh, since 2014 a steady increase of the CT1 ratio for all the banks. Also, the, let's say, less capitalized banks improve significantly their position. And I think this is also confirmed by the trend in the leverage ratio. Sometimes there is this discussion on the uh, weighted versus unweighted uh, level of capitals, but I think the leverage ratio is a good demonstration that the banking sector improved their position, also uh, looking at the non-risk-based uh, metrics. Um, on asset quality, I would say, is a bit more of a mixed uh, picture. Of course, there's been an incredible improvement in asset quality. If you look at the uh, NPL ratio in 2014 and you compare to the end of 2019, uh, you can uh, really see the, uh, the big uh, effort of banks uh, in uh, uh, getting rid of the legacy assets. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, notwithstanding the effort, which was particularly strong in the countries in which the uh, starting level was higher, uh, the uh, NPL ratio remains uh, quite high in some jurisdictions and still at pre-great financial crisis levels in some, in some countries. Uh, and uh, on the negative side, I think profitability is what uh, never recovers since the crisis. Of course, uh, I'm always discussing about averages. There are significant differences across banks uh, and across, uh, uh, across countries. But still, I think the general message is that uh, uh, retro on equity is poor and uh, for many banks is still uh, not sufficient to cover the, the cost of equity. Now, the first, so the, the, I think the, the slide, uh, the, the slide I just presented is, uh, in, in our view, just pure facts because these are based on data that we received uh, for end 2019. The second step of our analysis was an attempt to understand uh, the impact of the supervisory measures put forward by the supervisors and regulators in uh, in Europe. I mean, I will not go through it because I think uh, there have been, uh, let's say, many. Uh, webinars on this topic uh, organized by, by Elena, but uh, you may recall that uh, measures on the supervisory side uh, have been uh, going in the direction of allowing banks to use the uh, macro credential buffers where possible to actually redu uh, reduce the level of the buffer requirements uh, and the possibility of using uh, uh, instruments other than CT1 for covering uh, P2R. And in addition, the SSM also clarified that banks can operate under the P2G on a temporary basis. I would say as a sort of price to pay for this uh, uh, capital relief, uh, we also ask banks uh, to restrict uh, dividend, uh, dividend payouts. So this has been another uh, component boosting the capital position of the banks. I would say needless to say, these measures are more or less effective depending on, on various factors. And this is why we put a chart with the country by country breakdown. In some countries, the macro prudential buffers were very little. So of course the relief is also uh, more limited. Uh, in uh, other jurisdictions or some banks have uh, actually uh, actually shortfall in terms of 81 and tier two, which means also that the uh, relief in terms of uh, the coverage of P2R is less, uh, is less, uh, is less important. And, and of course, uh, banks with uh, little profitability and little earnings, uh, uh, they don't actually uh, boost the capital position uh, uh, restricting the restrict, uh, with the restriction of, of dividends. Uh, but I would say overall, uh, the impact uh, has been on average quite significant. The bank started uh, uh, with around 300 basis point of management buffer. 
which is what banks are holding uh, on the top of the overall capital requirement, uh, uh, which is uh, P2R uh, P2 and the combined buffer requirement uh, and, uh, and P2G. And as the result of the measures, uh, the uh, management buffer is now 500 basis point, uh, including the, let's say, 90 basis point coming from the possibility of uh, uh, operating below uh, P2G, P2G requirement. So there are basically 500 basis point before even touching uh, the uh, remaining macro potential buffer. And on this, I want to be very clear, especially because Veronique is listening to me, uh, the overall capital requirement is not a minimum requirement. So can still be breached. Of course, uh, going below the overall capital requirement implies uh, triggering the additional restrictions on uh, dividends uh, and 81 uh, coupon payments because it is uh, uh, part of the, let's say, conservation rules uh, uh, set up by the Basel, by the Basel agreement. But uh, the message was uh, this uh, additional buffer before touching uh, the minimum requirement and P2R is something that banks should uh, be using for providing lending to the economy. Now, of course, in terms of the impact, uh, which is uh, more, let's say, the more speculative part of our analysis, given the uncertainty on the macroeconomic forecast and the fact that we decided not to run our stress test, so we didn't receive any fresh data from the banks uh, and we didn't receive any uh, projections coming from the banks. Uh, uh, so the impact uh, depends very much on the exposures towards uh, specific sectors, the ones more affected uh, uh, by the crisis, and also on the country, country exposures. Now, if you look at the data, uh, and of course there is some uh, element of judgment in assessing which are the sectors uh, mostly affected, uh, around 57% uh, of the exposures of European banks towards non-financial corporations are uh, uh, in the direction of uh, those sectors which are uh, mostly impacted by the crisis. So accommodation, uh, food services, manufacturing, electricity, and uh, transport. Um, so potentially all these uh, um, exposures are the ones uh, more at risk uh, of a deterioration in the macroeconomic, uh, uh, macroeconomic forecast and uh, in terms of possible impact on asset quality. We decided to run uh, three sensitivities for credit risk, uh, in a way very simple exercises. In the first one, we decided to apply the same uh, transition rates uh, and migration from uh, IFRS 9 stages we experienced in the 2018 uh, uh, stress test. So this is bank by bank, at least for the banks uh, which were in our sample in 2018, uh, but also means that this is very much driven by the scenario we were running in 2018, which of course is not the one uh, we are currently dealing with. Uh, and in addition, uh, we applied in sensitivity two an additional uh, add-on uh, for some selected uh, sectors, the ones, um, as I said, the more affected, and uh, finally, in sensitivity three, which is the, the most severe, we also uh, uh, included an additional uh, shock uh, for the countries more affected by, by the crisis. And you can see that moving from sensitivity one to sensitivity three, the impact is uh, becoming larger and larger up to 380 basis point of capital uh, uh, depletion. Uh, and of course, within each of the sensitivities, there is then a wide dispersion across banks. So the impact can be as high as 450 basis point for some banks in sensitivity three. I have, let's say, quite a few caveats on this analysis, but I will be back on this uh, at, the, at the end. And I would say the final step of our assessment was to compare the uh, management buffers uh, with the uh, possible impact ca ca coming from the crisis. And I think the uh, arithmetic here is very, is very simple. We have 500 basis point of management buffer, uh, 380 basis point on average of uh, impact from credit risk. So there will remain still uh, more than 100 basis point of management buffer uh, for, potential lending, uh, for potential lending to the economy. And as I said, and I would like to repeat, uh, this is without even touching the overall capital requirement, which potentially is a further uh, 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 headroom for, uh, uh, for absorbing losses on the one end and uh, expanding uh, the balance sheets on the, on the other. Um, our analysis is very much focused on the averages, but uh, uh, if, and, and, we, and I think our methodology is not sophisticated enough uh, for looking uh, uh, bank by bank. Uh, but of course, our analysis is run bank by bank. So the dispersion is, uh, is, is significant. We didn't feel, let's say, sufficiently comfortable to provide any uh, bank by bank, but not even country by country figures. So we only provided you uh, figures. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, let's say it's not a mystery that some banks are weaker than others. This can depend on the uh, 
let's say, lower starting points in terms of capital, but also uh, higher exposures to countries or sectors more affected. So these banks can be uh, dealing with uh, more uh, uh, with more uh, with more challenges, especially if the crisis uh, uh, deteriorates uh, further. And these are, of course, uh, the banks uh, which require more uh, supervisory uh, attention. Now, I promise some caveats in our analysis. So first, uh, uh, in our sensitivity, we only cover credit risk. In the report we publish, we actually have also sensitivities for market risk uh, and uh, for other uh, sources of risk, for instance, uh, on, the, uh, on the reduction of the net interest income. Uh, but of course, since they are sensitivities, uh, we cannot uh, sum them up because it's not a internally consistent uh, framework. So it would be misleading and can be potentially an uh, overlap uh, of, uh, of risks. So we didn't want to do that. And we focus on credit risk, which is uh, uh, the main source of risk for the banks in our sample anyway, and is the most material. Uh, also, we didn't, uh, uh, we started the, from the data uh, as, for, as of December 2019. So we didn't incorporate any possible expansion of the risk weighted assets because of the uh, uh, extended use of credit lines, which was very, uh, let's say, uh, common, especially at the start of the crisis the, by uh, non-financial corporations. Uh, and of course, as I said, the, the sensitivities are based on 2018. So it's with all the, uh, with all the consequences in terms of the scenario we are implicitly uh, assuming. And so all these elements are, let's say, uh, suggesting that our estimates can be, uh, let's say, less conservative. On the other end, we also have elements uh, which would uh, mitigate the impact of the crisis, which we didn't consider. So first of all, we didn't consider profits, uh, which of course, even if little, would absorb a part of the, of the losses. We don't consider any possible beneficial effect of the loan moratoria or public guarantees, which have been introduced by uh, many uh, jurisdictions uh, and more generally by all the fiscal and monetary policy supporting the economy in the aftermath of the of the crisis. Quick conclusions. Uh, uh, so banks uh, 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 entered the crisis uh, with strong capital and liquidity position. This is also thanks uh, to the post-crisis reforms. I think this has been a test uh, of the reforms uh, showing that uh, the uh, tight, uh, the tighter requirements also allowed then supervisors to be more flexible uh, in reacting uh, uh, to the crisis. And I think the response has been uh, quick, uh, has been coordinated uh, and uh, uh, proved to be, uh, to be effective. Um, there has been beyond the supervisory actions also other actions, as I mentioned already, public guarantees, loan moratoria, but I would say notwithstanding the benefits of these measures, our expectation is that there will be a deterioration asset quality, and this would be one of the main issues for the, for the banking sector. And as I mentioned, while on average banks are strong, there are outliers, uh, uh, some banks uh, with uh, pre-existing problems, or some banks uh, without problems before the crisis, but with uh, significant exposures to some of the most uh, fragile, uh, fragile sectors. Uh, and then of course, uh, the long-term challenges uh, uh, pre-crisis are still there. So the low profitability, the uh, business models, which are not always sustainable, and the overcapacity in the sectors are issues that uh, of course can be um, uh, exacerbated by, by the crisis. Before I stop, if I can, just two uh, short digressions uh, for, let's say, for discussion. Uh, we decided at the ABA not to run the 2020 stress test uh, once the crisis started, notwithstanding the exercise was already ongoing. We were very close to receive the first submission of data from the banks. And I would say on the one end, there was a challenge, uh, which was uh, whether the scenario would have been informative or not, given uh, the uncertainty on the impact of the crisis. But the main reason for postponing the stress test was the operational burden and the challenges for banks. So we wanted to provide operational relief to banks and this is the main driver for postponing the exercise. But of course, then we realized that uh, stress test is very helpful in uh, this kind of situation for understanding better uh, the situation and for making decisions. So eventually we ended up running our sensitivity analysis and many authorities are running top-down stress tests or additional vulnerability assessments. So the point here is, is it uh, 
uh, I mean, which is the role of a stress test in a crisis. Sometimes people tend to say, we are already in a crisis, we don't need a stress test. I believe that we do need a stress test even in a, even in a crisis, because eventually you end up uh, doing something which is uh, an alternative. Of course, in a crisis, you have more challenges, and I would leave, uh, let's say, the challenges to till probably. So which kind of scenario should be used, whether it should be more counter-cyclical. Uh, if we need a pass-fail exercise, uh, uh, because eventually we need to identify banks uh, requiring uh, recapitalization, uh, the challenges in running a bottom-up versus a top-down, and uh, to what extent the results should be disclosed bank by bank, which is uh, the standard practice of the EBA, is our, uh, let's say, brand, uh, we believe is very helpful, but of course there are different views uh, on this, uh, in this respect. Uh, we use the sensitivities, as I mentioned, as a second best. Uh, we believe that what we do is, uh, let's say, sufficiently accurate on average, because we have anyway granular and quality assured data coming from the 2018 stress test, because it was uh, uh, more flexible than running a fully blown uh, stress test. Uh, and of course, we have the flexibility of changing uh, specific risk parameters, uh, leaving uh, uh, other aspects unchanged. So we can play a bit uh, with the numbers. Of course, there are also limitations. Uh, uh, in particular, we have uncertainty you know, whether the uh, um, transition matrices we are using are still uh, 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 reliable given uh, the current macroeconomic forecast. Uh, we cannot, of course, uh, include any impact of the government measure, monetary, politi monetary policy measures, uh, um, and uh, the selection of the countries and uh, uh, sectors more affected is to some extent judgmental. So, of course, we use some of the data on the contagion, but it is, uh, at the end of the day, something which is uh, our, our call. So, in, in, for all these reasons, I think uh, stress test is still the first best, uh, and the sensitivities we run is a second best uh, given the, uh, let's say, the sudden operational challenges for, uh, for banks. And I will uh, uh, close it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mario, this has been a very interesting, a very clear presentation. I'm sure that I've seen already a lot of questions and I have some myself, but before I give the floor back to you, let's move now to Veronique with the private sector opinion. And welcome back to Till. Veronique, please, the floor is yours. Excellent. So thank you very much, first of all, uh, for, for having me today. Uh, I have to apologize for my French accents, actually, despite my Italian names, I'm, I'm not Italian. Uh, and so I will uh, speak, speak in English. Um, I'm, uh, I, I fully agree with um, most that uh, has been said uh, by, by uh, Mario, and uh, I, I will just take uh, maybe a complementary uh, angle. Um, which uh, is from the point of view of the practitioner that, uh, that we are as a bank. So my first message is to show that um, in front of this crisis, the banks uh, are, um, are part of the solution, have been uh, very active in supporting the, uh, the, the, their clients, whether corporates or households, uh, hand in hand with, uh, with policymakers. So while, uh, of course, it's natural that the regulatory community and the supervisory community is... Uh, uh, preparing for the worst, if you like, with the, especially the stress test, it's also our duty to deliver the better, I would say, and, uh, and uh, I cannot exclude that we could have a slightly better news um, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, this is starting, uh, the recovery seems to go well in France, I hope uh, uh, the best for each of the country, depending on how they were affected, it, definitely uh, Italy was, uh, was quite affected and, and, and uh, we, we stand um, hand in hand also with our Italian friends. So um, the, I, I used there the, uh, the stats by the ECB. So these are Euro area statistics showing the increase of uh, lending to, uh, to corporates since the onset of the crisis. And you can see the spike in uh, additional lending in March, followed by still very high level in April and May. And the total actually uh, additional uh, outstandings in uh, NFCs in, in the euro area has increased by 250 billion euros. This is totally unprecedented. Can you move to page two, please? Yes, exactly. So, Veronique, if you could please indicate the slight number to, to, to Jan, yes. so that he can move it accordingly. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Go on. Um, uh, how much is uh, 250 billion euros? This is, this is a huge number. Uh, it is maybe to be compared with the um, assumption, I think it comes from the EBA report as well, which is uh, uh, translating the uh, regulatory and supervisory flexibility into 
an amount uh, of potential lending and loss absorption. So it's the uh, same uh, figures, I think, that the one that Mario uh, presented, but, but presented in terms of uh, uh, exposure amounts as opposed to uh, capital amounts or, risk ba or basis points. Uh, and this uh, range is point, point 0.6 to 1.3 trillion euro, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So this seems like a huge amount and has been communicated as, you know, the effectiveness of the regulatory response providing to banks the capacity to lend more. Um, first of all, and I'm sure we will come back to that in the Q&A, uh, it is not quite uh, easy to use the capital buffers. Hopefully we, we may not need it. And this is what Mario just, uh, just told us as well. Um, the second point, which I think is very important, is that if the relief is exclusively focused on the risk-based capital and it does not take into account other dimensions of capital management, such as leverage, uh, MRL TILAC, uh, scoring, whether GSIBs or DSIBs, uh, contributions to, to funds uh, and, and other taxes, of course, um, we will not be able to, to, to deliver these, uh, these amounts. So uh, the amounts of potential unlocked lending that are exclusively based on CT1 can be slightly misleading. And what we need is a real multidimensional analysis and a balanced relief across all axes. We've, we've tried our best to convince, uh, in particular, the Commission and a number of member states as part of the quick fix of the need to, to deliver also some relief on the leverage uh, aspect. Um, it may not be totally uh, properly understood that we are really in a multidimensional world in terms of capital. And last point, and I think it was also uh, It's quite uh, difficult so analysis of how uh, we impact the, the losses. And it's important that has not been taken into account so far. And the EBA, uh, by the EBA report that up to 30% of the losses on, uh, on COVID-related uh, loans, and in particular state-granted loans, could be transferred to the to the government. So it's kind of a, obviously it's a dual double-edged sword. Uh, it's better for the banks. Uh, it reduces the vulnerability of the banks. This is why those government guarantees are there in the first place. But also, of course, it puts some more fiscal pressure on the government. Moving to stage um, page three, please. Can we move to to page? Yes, yeah, thank you. I will not comment this slide. It's a bit dizzy, uh, but it's uh, it's there to give you um, a little bit of a step back of what has happened in other jurisdictions. Um, as you can see, um, uh, we, we've listed there the the, the most important uh, reliefs. Um, those flexibility measures are certainly very welcome, and and we have to to thank the, the dedication of all the authorities that have worked very very hard in the last uh, two three months to deliver those uh, flexibility measures. However, it is, we also need to remember that uh, the gap is widening with other jurisdictions, in particular the US, where the steps towards flexibility have been much more uh, decisive, I would say. And in many cases, uh, Europe has indeed implemented some flexibility, but I would say with a glass half full, uh, rather than saying half empty, but still not fully uh, full. Um, I, we also added a column on the UK because I think it's important also to have a look now uh, ahead of the uh, of the Brexit that uh, there are some uh, some some differences I would say that are starting to emerge in the way that the UK is implementing uh, regulation. Uh, so far, it's it's rather limited, uh, but but uh, it, it's important to monitor that in terms of level playing field going forward in the in the Brexit. Moving forward to the to the next page, please, uh, in the interest of time. And if anybody has questions on specific measures, of course, I'd be happy to answer. Can we move to the next page, please? Thank you. So, um, what's next? Where do we stand now? Um, so, three 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 things and and three horizons, I would say. The first horizon is the immediate uh, horizon, and we are all still very busy in making urgent measures work. There has been, of course, a lot of announcements, and I'm not sure whether the, all the audience is aware that, that uh, all these announcements are just taking shape now. 
and there is still actually a lot of regulatory uncertainty. For example, on moratoria, uh, we still are unsure about uh, what's going on outside of, of the EU 27, I would say. The UK uh, approach to moratoria has been considered by the EBA as non-compliance. Um, third countries, there is no statement at all in terms of how will moratoria that we as an international banks are granted to our clients, whether in the US or in Turkey or in Asia, will be considered from an IFRS 9 and forbearance standpoint. Syndicated loans um, is an animal which is obviously very important in terms of volumes, but it doesn't fit very well in the EBA moratorium approach, which is country by country. And in most cases, syndicated loans are obviously cross-country delivered by, by, by various uh, banks in various countries within and outside Europe. So uh, as we speak, and we are on the 2nd of July, and we are obviously starting to close our accounts for the end of June, a lot of things are still not uh, clear. On the quick fix measures, um, I would say that this has been an achievement to, to deliver and, and publish in the official journal uh, on, the, on June 27th in less than two months, a series of measures that are very, uh, very useful and, and, and constructive. However, some of them are still not activated. Um, there seems to be some, some second thought uh, on, on the side of the central bank, uh, of the ECB about the central bank deposits exemption from the leverage exposure. Frankly, I wonder why, but uh, maybe we can discuss that. Of course, software has been accelerated, but is subject to the finalization of the RTS by the EBA. So uh, a number of those measures are, are uh, actually not going to deliver, I would say, immediate benefits. But that's, uh, well, that's the regulatory uncertainty. Maybe more uh, important and, and worrying is fragmentation. By definition, the measures uh, that have been put in place uh, as a response to the crisis have been mostly at the national level, uh, with uh, the European Commission at the very beginning uh, handing over, I would say, to the member states by providing flexibility on two key aspects, one being the state aid and the second being the flexibility on the Maastricht criteria. So clearly the member states have taken the lead and have adapted their measures to their local uh, situation. As a result, we have all sorts of forms of poor public guarantees, uh, which triggers all sorts of eligibility or non-eligibility for credit mitigation in the CRR, and all sorts of haircuts in the ECB collateral policy. And um, I, I, I insist on this point because this is quite worrying in, to the extent that it is, a, it is a step toward the reinstallation of the so-called uh, um, uh, fragmentation uh, in, the, in the euro area. I think Nicolas has this point. Um, looking at the spreads of sovereigns is nice, and, and indeed uh, the ECB has done a lot. But uh, looking also at the capacity for the banks to have a level playing field and to provide competitive pricing uh, to their clients in the various countries is very important. Uh, and, and we would need some, uh, some leveling of the, of the measures uh, at that level. The second horizon is to prepare for the next challenge. And, and when I say, uh, when I started to talk about that maybe one month ago or six weeks ago, it was kind of medium term. I think now that we, it, it is really um, what we need to work on uh, immediately and, and very decisively. What is the next challenge? The next challenge is that at the end of the moratoria and at the end of the uh, state guarantees, um, we will be facing a wall of debt. I think there's an increasing recognition that corporates have been injecting a, a lot of debt, starting already from a high leverage. And so what we need now is equity or quasi-equity injections, moving from a liquidity support to a solvency support. I can elaborate in the Q&A if you want. Second point is the revival of the capital market union is key because banks are increasing their balance sheet uh, very uh, massively, as, as, I, as I showed in my first slide, uh, and we need securitization now more than ever to be able over the next year or two to, to shift part of this exposure toward the market. Because by the way, it's important to realize that all this immediate support is going to translate into long-term exposure in our balance sheet. A lot of those loans will be five years loans, six years loans. And so they will, their, their, their footprint in our balance sheet, if you like, is going to remain uh, for quite some time. And this is why securitization will be extremely important. Final point in that second horizon is the NPL action plan. The NPL action plan has been designed in 2017 in a totally different context, which was a kind of 
legacy of the, of the previous crisis and, and accelerating the reduction of NPLs to prepare for the next crisis. Well, guess what? Here is the, the next crisis here. And therefore, it is not realistic to that NPLs will use uh, post this. So, uh, in terms of what incentives the policymakers want to give to the banks, in terms of do we still want to uh, incentivize the banks to shift uh, to shift assets out of the balance sheet, uh, providing incentives to sell and accelerated provisioning, as is the case currently, or should we prefer a more, I would say, socially responsible attitude and workout practices by the banks? I, I, I leave it as an open question, but I think it is a very fundamental point that needs to be tackled in the, couple, in the next few months. And then, of course, we will talk about the new normal, financing the recovery. Green finance is accelerating. This is great. Um, one point, and, and Mario mentioned the, the, this kind of strange, I must say, quid pro quo between flexibility in regulation and uh, dividend uh, limitation. I think it is very important that banks remain investable, seen from the market. And I can also elaborate on that uh, in the Q&A. And my third point is uh, back to the first one, fragmentation, progress and integration. I think this is absolutely essential if we want to have efficient transmission of monetary policy and, uh, and avoid um, uh, any uh, sovereign debt uh, problem uh, to come in the, in the future. Coming on regulation per se, um, I, would, I would have three points. The first is that uh, the crisis has evidenced that we needed more flexibility in the regulatory framework uh, on technical aspects and on more institutional aspects, I would say on technical aspects. Here I give the example of the credit risk mitigation approach, which is clearly too binary. Um, if the state provides a guarantee which is not 100% eligible to the CRR, it is taken into account for zero. And it should not be the case. We should be allowed to have, uh, you know, a, a, a more risk-sensitive approach to credit risk mitigation. Um, flexibility also in terms of the role of, of the level one text. Maybe we have too much in the level one text, and this is why the supervisors and the regulators were not in the position to implement all the flexibility uh, of the Basel Committee, for example. And we had to go through the quick fix, and it, it, it was quick, so it's great, but do we really need to change the legislation every time there is a crisis or something to be changed? And that, of course, probably re requires more trust in authorities. The second point is the buffer usability. It certainly doesn't work as it was intended. Um, and, and so we probably need to sit down and brainstorm in terms of what can, we, can be done uh, on that part. And this is also a, a full uh, debate that I'm happy to, to discuss in the Q&A. And finally, uh, we've seen also that some technical measures uh, have, have, have proven to be excessively pro-cyclical. Um, and there has been some temporary adjustments in the, in the crisis, like on Proval, very welcome, and on IFRS 9, but I think we need to, to revisit to which extent some of those issues have to be solved on a permanent basis in the current regulation. Also in the new regulation, so as we are on the verge of implementing Basel IV, we should also wonder whether implementing FATB, if FATB had been in place during this crisis, probably all investment banks would have to reclassify a lot of their desks in the standardized approach with a huge amount of capital increase, up risk as well. And, you know, uh, a lot of uh, pro cyclicality also in the, in the ILM framework. And finally, how to address backtesting of models in the context of such, a, uh, I would say, a unique crisis. Of course, each crisis is unique in a way. Um, do we need to exclude some observations of, of very, very high uh, NPLs, for example, in the future, or very, very high market observations from, uh, from backtesting of models? Or are we going to carry over the severity and suddenly uh, suddenness of, the, of this crisis for the 10 years to come, which would be extremely penalizing for banks and for, and for the economy. I'll stop there and, um, and be happy to answer questions and debate uh, with other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronique. Thank you very much. Let me just say that your uh, uh, voice sometimes was interrupted. I mean, it was a little bit broken at times, in particular at the beginning. So we will be able to distribute your slides and also in the recording of the video, we will try to improve the audio quality so that it will be easier 
to catch each single word that you said. So now we go to Till Schurman, and I'm sorry, but I need to ask Till and Nicola to really stick to the time because we are running a bit late and we would like to have the Q&A uh, long enough. So Till, where have you gone? Where are you? Okay, you're back. I, okay. Okay. Manage, managing some of the lighting. Let me try to share the screen. My apologies. Okay, uh, so uh, please, the floor is yours and please try to stick to the time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to this webinar. <clears throat> I really appreciate the participation. Um, let me try to uh, get right to it. So, <clears throat> look, with so much bad news and so much uncertainty, the real question that we're all asking ourselves is: Should we worry about the banks? <clears throat> and it's you know it's very hard to design and implement policy. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of remarkable just how much has been done, uh, both on the public health side, obviously, but also on the bank's ability side. The hard thing, the real core question for me is though, you know, how do you do this with poor information? In the, for the public health perspective, it's very straightforward. We say test, test, test is the best way to, uh, to learn about the public health crisis. And so similarly for bank health, <clears throat> I think the objective is to do stress test uh, is probably the best way to learn about the health of the patient called the banking system. Uh, the banks certainly entered the crisis a lot better capitalized than the last one. That seems to be without question. The obvious question is, do they have enough? But the more constructive question to make progress is, well, how do we know? <clears throat> and stress tests really have become the tool of choice, uh, not you know, uh, from the last crisis, but then also during, during peacetime, <clears throat> about assessing bank resilience to shocks. <clears throat> Mario rightly said, you know, we have to think about uh, which shocks and which scenarios then to try, and I'll talk a little bit about that. To be sure, uh, the pandemic as a scenario <clears throat> sh uh, showed up uh, in the risk inventory of nearly every bank that I've worked with, but it never really made it to the top, and it did not enter <clears throat> the, risks, uh, the scenario library with such widespread and massive economic fallout. So <clears throat> the uncertainty is very high, now, makes the risk management problem uh, exponentially more difficult. Uh, it's not enough to just to try one scenario. <clears throat> we have to try a lot of scenarios, a wide range of scenarios. <clears throat> and of course, both the EU and the US regime have conducted sensitivity analysis on their banks. That's been, an, I think, the, exactly the right approach to sort of feeling your way around this problem. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, the approach has been very different, and of course, the, probably one of the main differences is that the, the U.S. regime uh, decided to continue and complete their 2020 stress test, um, and then base sensitivities on fresh information as opposed to information that is um, uh, that's a little bit uh, older. So, <clears throat> what are the kind of scenarios you want to try? Um, I'm going to speak. On, Unfortunately, from the myopic perspective of the U.S. economy, we've, but I think these basic patterns are, are generic. We've been talking about various different kinds of uh, paths for the economy. <clears throat> uh, you know, when early we hoped that we would be lucky and looked at B-shaped uh, recovery, uh, they're becoming gradually more pessimistic, whether it is a U-shaped or something in between. <clears throat> The W-shaped uh, recovery is one that I think is increasingly uh, relevant to talk about it essentially says that there's going to be a second hit uh, to the economy, perhaps uh, coming from uh, second or more or further waves in the pandemic. <clears throat> and then of course, there's the more depressing L-shaped recovery, which means that the economy never fully recovers from this, from this event, from this shock. <clears throat> if we uh, actually look at uh, what I wanted to do here in this chart is compare uh, in an index form uh, the path that the uh, financial crisis took, at least in the U.S. economy, compare that in red, compare that to the current consensus path in the U.S. economy uh, in blue, uh, which is a more gradual sort of U or swoosh-shaped recovery, uh, albeit one humped, <clears throat> so monotonically increasing. We'll see if that turns out to be the case. <laughs> and then in green, I have, the uh, I have the stress test scenario that was used by the Fed uh, for the current bank stress test. <clears throat> you know, the shapes are remarkably different uh, between what, we, uh, what is unfolding before us and what the CCAR scenario actually um, uh, painted. <clears throat> uh, the cumulative GDP loss under the CCAR scenario is worse than under the 
uh, current uh, pro uh, con uh, consensus projection, but treat matters. And with that in mind, <coughs> the, <coughs> the Fed tried three of those different uh, kinds of recoveries. So in the <coughs> block on the left is the, are the final uh, CET, or the minimum CET1 ratios <coughs> across the ba uh, banks that were stress tested, there were 33 of them. Uh, from the uh, scenario that was painted, that was the one that was sort of a gradual financial crisis-like, but fairly deep, deeper than what actually happened in the financial crisis. <clears throat> Average starting ratio was 12% uh, CET1. So the kinds of consumptions that we're looking at <clears throat> are 210 basis points on average in the severely adverse. <clears throat> and then there are three alternative scenarios that were tried, a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery, and then I think the probably most interesting uh, one is the W-shaped recovery, in other words, one with a second hit. That's the one that is the most adverse and severe uh, with, um, uh, with uh, if you will, CET1 damage that's double uh, on average than what it is in the severely adverse. Uh, but it is based importantly on fresh numbers. Its sensitivity to the, uh, to the if you will, baseline stress results uh, <coughs> from, from this year. Importantly, also back to Mario's point, because these are, I like this uh, use of the term second best, these are second best uh, sensitivity analysis. You'd love to do a full blown run with all three scenarios. Um, uh, the Fed, much like the EBA, had a, a more muted approach to the disclosures to do it at an aggregate level rather than bank by bank level, uh, given, the uncertain, given the uncertainty that's around those estimates relative to what the baseline scenario is. So, um, the loss rates, uh, uh, those, those are uh, the CET1 impact. The loss rates just quickly varied also quite a bit across the scenarios. Uh, in this picture, there's the additional uh, information of just looking at, well, what's the, uh, what are the loss rates that were actually experienced during the financial crisis? Uh, those are actually a bit higher than those under the projected baseline projected scenarios, but still lower than under the alternative uh, sensitivity scenarios. <clears throat> So, you know, uh, to wrap up, um, the trick from my perspective really is testing, testing, testing. You want to test the population uh, and you hope that uh, the, the people can develop antibodies uh, uh, to hopefully remain resilient. And then similarly, banks can stock up on financial capital and develop human capital to remain resilient. But in the end, we have to test and test to, ver to, uh, to, uh, to really check the resilience of people. Uh, of the banks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots of questions from this presentation, in particular uh, the, the difference between the Europe approach and the US approach, but we will discuss later. Now the floor is to Nicola, and please again try to stick to the time. Thanks. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm trying to share. Yeah, here we go. Um, slide. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Elena and uh, all uh, the organization team for having me. Uh, it's a great series of events you have uh, in Florence, so, uh, so I, um, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, I'll try to indeed be disciplined. Um, the, the experience so far, I think I, I will echo a lot of things that have already been said. Uh, I think it's remarkable that there has been no financial instability except for a very brief moment in mid-March. Uh, we have seen a lot of market movements, of course, but pretty orderly, which is remarkable given the magnitude of the shock. And even more remarkable in the context of the Eurozone, the apparent absence to a large extent of financial fragmentation. Uh, and that's obviously thanks to the efforts of the ECB, the PEPP, and from mid-May, decisively, uh, the leadership uh, taken from, by the German government. Of course, the negotiation is not over, but, uh, but, but I think this is uh, actually remarkable. Equally remarkable uh, is the vindication of two major reforms of the previous decade. One is Basel III. Uh, even if, I mean, uh, as was mentioned, there is a bit of concern at the ECB that their capital relief is not used for lending. But I think the, the, the first order observations that has to be made and repeated is thank God we had Basel III. And I think this has to qualify, and I hope Veronique will not be offended, uh, you know, any pleading by banks at this point that you know, increased capital requirements are bad and FRTB will be horrible and things like that. 
because these are the exact same arguments that the banking industry uh, has been deploying for 10 years, saying that Basel III would be a disaster. And Basel III has been so comprehensively vindicated in terms of the increase in capital requirements and the buffers that gives in the case of a shock that I think we should really keep that in mind uh, kind of permanently. Equally important, but perhaps less visible, is the vindication of European banking supervision, also known as a single supervisory mechanism. This is a kind of more invisible thing, but just uh, make a thought experiment. Imagine that we had the COVID shock with national banking supervision. And what would have happened would have been the exact same kind of collective action problem that we had uh, repeatedly between 2007 and 2012, where no national supervisor would have wanted to take action because of the stigma effect. So for example, if you think of the limitation of dividends, which I think was a very uh, welcome act of leadership by the ECB, this would have been completely impossible under the previous design. So uh, I'm the first to say that banking unions is unfinished and that's a problem, but the bank supervisory piece of it, the SSM is pretty much uh, complete and that has made a massive uh, positive difference. Now, having said that, it's obvious that there is uh, enormous uncertainty about what comes next. Here I will echo what Tell has been saying, you know, you need to test, 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 and be a bit paranoid about the next steps, no complacency. And the rest of my presentation uh, will actually be um, about that, uh, uh, about, you know, uh, what happens as things uh, take a turn for the worst. Just one additional point about the absence of fragmentation, which I forgot to mention, you also see it in the deployment of um, lending support measures by member states. And we have forthcoming uh, research on this with two colleagues at Bruegel, which suggests that there is really no correlation between the uh, lending support as they are deployed, as opposed to headline announcements, you know, uh, bank guarantee, uh, government guaranteed lending and things like that, no correlation with fiscal uh, stress or uh, uh, the kind of drivers of fragmentation that we have seen in the past. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's important to note as well. Now, what happens if things turn bad? So it's a big if, and at this point, I, I for one, um, echoing things said by others, I'm not willing to conclude that we're in a situation of system-wide fragility. There, there, there is a lot of um, discussion, of course, in uh, our community about that, and there are scholars whose uh, judgment I respect who think that, you know, uh, measures should be taken immediately along the lines that I will now uh, suggest, but uh, I don't share that view. I think it's too early to be sure these measures are pretty radical and uh, they should only be envisaged if there is a higher degree of confidence that we are facing system-wide fragility than is the, is the case at the moment. As Veronique mentioned, the latest indicators of recovery in the Eurozone are actually quite good. Uh, they look like a V-shaped recovery. And if we do have a V-shaped recovery uh, with a, a few more finger crossed, we may uh, be able to avoid all the things I will talk about now. But if we come, if uh, authorities come to the conclusion that we are facing system-wide fragility, which again, I don't think is the case now, then uh, we have wisdom from previous crises that we should not neglect. And, and I think there are four big lessons of earlier crises that are important to emphasize here, and I will go very quickly for uh, the sake of time. The so first is direct ac uh, early action beats light reaction. If you wait, you have zombie banking, that's bad. You have banks gambling for resurrection, the cost is uh, higher uh, as a consequence, both in terms of lost GDP and in terms of uh, public cost of uh, getting the system back to shape. Number two, uh, you have to go system-wide. If you're facing system-wide fragility, if you try to resolve the problems one by one, or if you try to resolve only the problem of the weak banks and not the entire system, you play whack-a-mole, and actually uh, the, the problems that look idiosyncratic uh, become uh, systemic because there are ripple effects. So you have to actually go for the whole system um, repair, uh, even if that means intervention in banks that pretend they're sound or are, are actually sound. Uh, that was obviously the logic of TARP in the US in 2008, and I think there's a big uh, lesson here. The third one, uh, which is uh, also a matter of a lot of debate, is that 
action to restore soundness in a fragile system has to involve public recapitalization. It doesn't necessarily have to involve resolution. If you act early enough, you can avoid resolution because you're uh, dealing with fragile banks which are viable. Uh, and I think uh, that would be the ideal scenario in a way, not to wait for the mom uh, until the moment where banks are non-viable and, and, and require resolution. But asset relief schemes, also known in our debates as bad banks, are not enough to resolve a situation of system-wide fragility. I, I'm not aware of a single example where asset relief schemes on their own uh, have uh, been able to resolve that kind of situation. I know a lot of examples where that has been attempted and it has always failed. So I think it's very important to think of asset relief schemes as a possible tool and it can be useful but it's never the mainstay of the intervention if the intervention is to be successful. And of course, the last one is that uh, in the Eurozone, the bank sovereign vicious circle is deadly and uh, therefore fragmentation has to be avoided at all costs. So very quickly, my last slide, uh, the policy, the kind of uh, wonkish response to all that would be ESM direct precautionary recapitalization and it's an available tool which has been uh, not implemented, but decided and defined uh, in many ways. So I'm not going to go into the details of the slide. We may come back to it uh, in the discussion, but just to say is that essentially there's, a, there's a, 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 a best case scenario in case of the bad scenario of system-wide fragility. And that would be uh, an agreement to use ESM direct precautionary recapitalization on the scale of the whole system, by which I mean basically all the significant institutions that are in policy banks and are headquartered in the Eurozone, there are 84 of them with total assets of 21.5 trillion. Uh, and uh, that uh, would be, I think, the main uh, scenario on which policy thinking should focus. Uh, but of course, uh, with a big if in the title of the slide and with no recommendation from my side, I repeat this uh, to go for it right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. So now we have a lot of topics to discuss. So maybe what we do first is giving the microphone back to Mario. And uh, feel free to pick some of the comments of the commentator and reply to them. Maybe before you do it, let me just ask you some clarifications for the moment that comes from the participant. It's very much related to your assumption, the assumptions that you do in the analysis. So for example, what do you assume for mortgage portfolios? If this is the 2018 stress test or another scenario you have considered, the same is for the macroeconomic scenario. It is the adverse scenario of the stress test. I think maybe something has been missed of what you said. And lastly, uh, in clarification, you mentioned that you have been looking mostly or exclusively at the credit risk. And the question is whether you will be considering market and counterparty risk at some point. So feel free to pick some of the comments of the commentator and then we go back to the others as well. Okay, I will try. So on the, on the macro scenario, I think uh, I've seen that there, indeed there are a few questions. I think uh, here the point is we didn't run a top-down uh, stress test uh, and uh, we didn't run a uh, stress test. So in a way, we don't have a macroeconomic scenario. Now, the fact that we used the, the transition rates uh, submitted by banks as part of the 2018 stress test uh, means that at least if you look at GDP, you may have a sort of benchmark for understanding how severe these uh, crises can be compared to the previous one. Now, if you look at the scenario for 2018, if I remember well, the decline in GDP for the EU over the three years was around uh, minus 3%. Uh, and uh, I think this possibly compares to some of the, let's say, most uh, optimistic uh, current forecast for the COVID crisis, which is uh, a very strong decline in 2020, but then a quick uh, and uh, very uh, significant recovery in the next uh, two years. Then, of course, uh, if uh, uh, the scenario, the actual uh, scenario for the, the, the pandemic is, uh, is, uh, is more severe, let's say this part of our analysis is less conservative than uh, what uh, uh, would have been with a more severe scenario. On the other hand, as I said, the insensitivity tree is where we also have uh, uh, this additional shock uh, for the country and for the sectors more affected. So to some extent, we go beyond the transition rates uh, 
related to the 2018 scenario. Now, honestly, it's difficult to say at the end, I mean, to what kind of scenario this would correspond, because again, this is not a scenario analysis, but I think in terms of narrative, uh, I think we can say that uh, we are perhaps uh, having in mind uh, um, uh, something in between uh, the current uh, V-shape estimates and some of the U-shaped, if you consider also sensitivity two and three. Um, now, other risks, as I said, we cover most of the risks in our report. But since they are all, let's say, independent uh, uh, sensitivities with shocks which are, let's say, very judgmental and very rough, uh, is, it is not possible for us uh, in a consistent and, uh, uh, let's say, reasonable way to sum up the shocks. And this is also the reason why we don't compare first the losses with the profits and then we look at the impact on capital. So we look directly at the hit on, on capital, which is, let's say, much more severe than we would do in a stress test. I mean, we shouldn't forget that also, if you look at the results of the past stress test, even in the adverse scenario, banks are still making uh, significant profits, especially some of the banks. And of course, this is the first defense for banks before going, uh, going to capital. Now I can see some uh, sort of at least one uh, uh, skeptical face, uh, uh, Elena, but um, I think uh, in a way it is true that again, profits would not go to zero for all banks. So there will still, even if little profits, this would be the first uh, lobs, loss absorbing capacity before going to capital. So in, to some extent, this is more conservative. Now, on the mortgages, we did the, what we did for the rest. So it is uh, transition rates of the previous stress test, uh, of course, with the additional sensitivity, which is the, the country the country specific. So in this case, uh, there is this additional shock uh, if uh, the mortgage is in one of the uh, countries uh, more affected by, by the crisis. Um, in terms of uh, picking a couple of observations of the other panelists, I will be quick, Elena, so you can then uh, perhaps do a, uh, I don't know, a second round if you, if you feel so. I would say, um, I mean, on, on, on Veronique, uh, of course, I think uh, the, the point on the leverage ratio, I would say, I think uh, you are right in saying that, uh, let's say at some point, uh, we need to do a reflection on how the counter cyclicality in the macroprudential toolkit uh, interacts with the leverage ratio, which is, uh, let's say, not, uh, counter cyclical by design um, and perhaps also in the longer term once Basel 3 is fully implemented also with the output floor. So I think this is a good point because at some point indeed these components can become bindings. Uh, for the time being uh, looking at the banks uh, they are not so I don't think it's an immediate concern uh, and also I think I should uh, uh, remind everybody that the leverage ratio is not yet a requirement in Europe. So when we also discuss about level playing field with the US, I think uh, this is not uh, yet uh, a requirement. So of course, it's an important metrics that people are looking at, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not a requirement. And the same, I would say, for the software uh, RTS, I think we are working quite hard and quite quickly on having this done as soon as possible. And this, of course, would produce an additional capital relief. Once again, uh, even if, uh, uh, again, we understand that the urgency of the issue, and indeed, we are going very fast, including having a shorter consultation in the industry, again, given the current capital levels, I don't think there is really a urgent immediate need to have the relief. Uh, uh, is it more important to know that this is coming? So again, there is additional headroom. Uh, and again, also I understand that, the, let's say, the more uh, uh, communication aspect in terms of finalizing the, the, uh, the, the accounts, having this already considered, but in terms of actual need of capital, this is not, uh, is not, really, uh, is not really something that the banks uh, need now. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, on the on the last point is on the on the fragmentation. I mean, I very much agree with uh, with Veronique and with uh, with Nicola. This is uh, one of the risks of this crisis, as in previous crises. And to some extent, it's a bit unfortunate. I have seen that there were some uh, questions on what to do with NPLs. That uh, uh, after the previous crisis, there was no uh, real. Uh, creation of a, a European AMC, which now would be a very good tool already available and already operational. So this is uh, probably uh, one of the uh, missed uh, aspect uh, of, the previous, of the previous crisis. At the same time, we should say that there is already some work done. So we wouldn't restart from scratch. Now, I think servicers are much more uh, uh, um, able to cope with NPLs than they were before. They are much more specialized. Uh, the ABA put forward, let's say, data templates uh, for exchanging information and data between investors and banks. Uh, there has been also a lot of discussion uh, 
uh, on a possible platform for the exchange of NPLs. And there is the commission blueprint on, uh, on the AMC, which uh, uh, probably is not an immediately, uh, cannot be immediately operationalized, but already uh, contains a lot of elements which would facilitate uh, the restart of this, of this debate if there is appetite uh, for this. And I think I will stop here so we have more time. Okay, let me go to Veronique on this point because first of all, she was raising also the point that I share very much, I have to say. The point that yes, you have a buffer, you have a flexibility to use them, but it's not clear how much they're effectively used. So I, I think, and we had the discussions also with other uh, policy makers recently, good in the SSM, I think there is a sort of, I wouldn't say misperception, but if you talk to policymakers, they seem to be rather convinced that the stigma in using the flexibility of the buffers is not an issue and that the banks can make effective use of the buffers. When you said that you talk to the banks, they seem to suggest, as you did a little bit also in your talk earlier, that there is a difficulty in using this flexibility. So the question is, how much do you really see this difficulty? And if there is, what could eventually regulators do to allow banks to make a better use of this flexibility? So for example, rather than say, we allow banks to go below the, the capital requirement, for example, the P2G, we just lower the P2G so that there is not an issue of going below, but you just lower the requirement. How do you think we can combine somehow this, this, this situation? Um, thank you for the question. It's a, it's it's a very complex one, I, and I'm afraid I, I, I don't have a, I don't have a ready to use uh, solution. Uh, it, we have to to combine a lot of of of, uh, of issues. I see. Uh, I, I agree that the, the, definitely all the, the the construct of the of the buffers uh, that that are buffers, i.e., there to absorb losses, as was done in Basel, in the first phase of Basel III, um, is certainly extremely useful. Um, the NDA um, has obviously put a lot of of, of uh, rigidity in the capacity to use it. Um, and uh, I, I would refer to, to to Randy Quarles if you if you allow me. Um, as there was some, some discussion in the US, and finally they didn't choose this, uh, this solution, I don't know why, but there was an option that was considered at some point to say, why don't we, have, don't we put more emphasis on counter-cyclical buffer um, and, and reduce you know, commensurately the other buffers, like the capital conservation buffer, which is just there because it was useful, convenient at the time of the implementation of other three to do it quickly. But frankly, the, what I like, in a sense, in the counter-cyclical buffer is that it can be removed. So not only you, you provide more flexibility to the bank, but you actually you provide true flexibility to the extent that you reduce the level of the MDA. It makes a huge difference. So maybe the balance, but unfortunately, in a sense, uh, out of the combined buffer, uh, I don't have the figures, but this, the, the CCYB is probably a couple of, of basis points whereas the, the other combined buffers are, are, are really the bulk of it. So maybe that we could think, uh, uh, but again, this is one, one, one thought and then uh, more brainstorming than anything else, but maybe it would make sense to rebalance within the um, OCR, as the EBA would say, what are the ones that are fixed and need to, be met, uh, need to be met, otherwise there is the MDA, and what are those that are flexible and counter-cyclical and can adjust Self-adjust, if you like, uh, or adjust uh, by the by the by the supervisor, or the in this case the macro prudential authority, whoever is the is the right uh, is the right authority, but uh, can adjust so that the flexibility is 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 real and can be uh, and and can be leveraged uh, by the banks. I think uh, that would be certainly very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I will come back to you, but I see that we have only seven, eight minutes left. So maybe let me now move to Nicola and then Til. So Nicola, there are several questions from you, for you on the, this issue that you mentioned on public recapitalization. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the need eventually to public to public um, recapitalize banks and whether to some extent a public recapitalization is in contrast with uh, 
the idea that we want to discipline banks and somehow we can raise moral hazard issue if we know that there is public recapitalization. I mean, of course, this is a very different crisis from the past, but nevertheless, and to which extent this public recapitalization would eventually be feasible. Everything in three minutes, two. <laughs> okay. Um, moral hazard, maybe to start with that. Um, it's great to fight moral hazard, but when the survival of the system is at stake, you have to uh, put it in number two priority because the number one priority is to save the system. And if we have any um, uh, thinking from you know, uh, certain particular member states here, I will make the mention that since 2007, many German banks have had problems, not a single creditor, no matter how junior, of any German bank, to my knowledge, has taken a haircut. So, um, so, so when, we, uh, when we speak about moral hazard and disciplining mechanisms, we have to look at the real mechanisms, not the theoretical mechanisms. And, uh, and our performance in this uh, area, especially I have to say in Germany and France, uh, has been absolutely dismal uh, in the previous crisis. So we shouldn't be complacent here. I'm in favor of fighting moral hazard, but I think saving the system is the most important thing. And then you have to sink within those boundaries. We had a question from Wilson Irvin, for example, about uh, you know, the, the, that kind of preoccupation. I will say this, um, I, the plan I refer to, precautionary direct recapitalization of the entire system, is radical. It's not to be uh, a decision taken lightly. It's only to be triggered if we really need it. But if we need it, I think that's the way to go. Uh, and the, uh, the reference here is obviously TARP in 2008, not TARP as an asset relief program, which didn't work, but TARP as a recapitalization program, which I think worked very well. And the interesting thing is if you do it early enough, as I said, you can avoid resolution because thanks to Basel III, thanks to the fact, sorry, Veronique, that Basel III was real buffers and not only contracyclical stuff, you have a, a big distance to insolvency. So you have a big leeway to go for precautionary recapitalization that is generally precautionary uh, and not a kind of fig leaf for uh, you know, uh, saving a bank that is actually uh, insolvent. I think here, I would even say Europe has a more uh, consistent framework uh, than the US. The US at this point is showing a lot of signs of forbearance and excessive flexibility and excessive complacency. I think the decision of dividends is a very good example of that. Europe went quick and early and system-wide and uh, made a, a bigger show of leadership, I'm afraid, than the US equivalent. So, so I will stop there, but that basically is the gist of it. Okay, Thiel, just a question for you, of course, on the stress testing. So you have been saying, and you have been showing to us how the US has approached that. And the fact that the US conducted stress tests with a real, let's say, uh, more uh, updated uh, uh, scenario, if you want. And you also stress you also stress the fact that we need to stress, stress, stress with lots of scenarios. Now, I have two questions on you. First is, I understand that we need to use a multiplicity of scenario, but then we have to sort of make a judgment as to which scenario we find more likely or the likelihood of the different scenario doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we need to know which one is our baseline and how we think about the others. And second, you mentioned also that um, the disclosure was different because it was more on the aggregate level. And there are some questions from the panelists saying, what is will entail for the future, both Thiel and Mario? Are we thinking that there will be less disclosure at the individual bank level going forward given the situation? And if so, what can the market infer about the, uh, the, the single institutions? Thiel. Excellent, those are great questions. Thank you very much. So uh, first on the likelihood of the scenario, um, look, uh, if you have one scenario, you, if you decide as a matter of policy only to have one scenario, uh, you have, well, very, that, that becomes an extremely difficult choice. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and by having multiple scenarios, at least there's an acknowledgement about the degree of uncertainty. I think <clears throat> if you're faced with a situation where there's a lot of uncertainty about the range of outcomes that are plausible, then having more than one scenario, I think, is absolutely critical. Look, the OECD, for example, about uh, uh, two or three weeks ago, when it provided its updated forecast for GDP for its member countries and for the globe, uh, no longer 
provided just one forecast. It now provides two forecasts. Uh, that is essentially commensurate with a one-hit version of the pandemic. Think about that, a V or a U shape or something like that. And a two-hit version, uh, which uh, is commensurate with a W-shaped scenario. So that institution has already made clear we cannot forecast sensibly just one baseline. We have to do at least two baseline scenarios. So if there are two baseline scenarios that are now being considered, and I think that's actually quite reasonable, uh, it would be uh, you know, at least equally sensible to consider a multiplicity of, of stress scenarios. <clears throat> um, then secondly, on your question about disclosure, I think that's a really key one. I think that you, we have spoiled, uh, in some sense, on both sides of the, uh, of the Atlantic, uh, the, the public with very, very detailed disclosures uh, during the, all the peacetime stress tests, when there was time to do it, when there was time to carefully, you know, do all the work. <clears throat> and um, uh, with, <clears throat> with sort of that standard of, uh, of calculation and detail uh, established, it makes it a real challenge to then say, well, look, now we have to do something a little faster with a lot more uncertainty um, that can't possibly done to be done to the same standard, how do we then wrestle with like how much to disclose? And I have some sympathy for disclosing, uh, at least for now, um, a little less at a bank level and do it a little bit more at the, uh, you know, at some kind of an aggregate level. When things get really bad, so coming back to, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, uh, uh, you know, Nicola's point about radical action. If there's a view that radical action has to be done to do that without having really good or at least good information at a bank level and making some, making that public, I think would be, uh, I would be very nervous about implementing something radical without, without a lot more uh, information, both privately and publicly. Okay, let me give a, one question to each of you and then very briefly you all answer. Let me ask all together to save time. So to Mario, I would like to hear about this disclosure because even more your assessment doesn't even go on country level this time. So it's just a, a more European level. So what do you think about this going forward? Second, there is a question on how do you think about the sovereign bonds holdings of banks? Do you think the ECB somehow will take care of it or do we need to worry about it? Because of course there will be a lot of fiscal pressure in particular in some countries. To Veronique, what do you think about future consolidation of the sector? So they, we, we, we know there have been turmoil. The SSM has just issued some new guidelines is this the right direction? Do you think we still need the changes in order to incentivize banks to further consolidation? And to Nicola, we know that in time of crisis, you were positive on fragmentation. I'm a bit less positive on fragmentation than you, but somehow if we look at the European institutions, uh, this is the time where we have a further step in economic integration at least, at least at the institutional level. Crises are a big booster for it. So do you think this could be an occasion to move forward a little bit with the banking union or not? So maybe we start with Mario, then we go to Veronique and then to Nicola. And then the last question to Thiel. Stress testing in the US we know is different because of the treasury situation also. So this is somehow related a little bit to, to, to the question to Nicola. So to which extent can Europe implement the same stress test policy without having a treasury that backs and that can eventually recapitalize banks or be much more proactive in helping the sector. So just very quickly, Mario. Okay, so on the disclosure, I think I can be very quick. First, uh, we decided not to publish even the country results for, let's say, methodological constraints. So it was not, let's say, a policy or political decision. And indeed, uh, uh, after the publication of this report, we ran our spring uh, transparency exercise. So we did publish bank by bank uh, figures, uh, including uh, NACE code exposures, so sector by sector exposures, uh, capital levels, composition of capital, sovereign exposures. Uh, so this is very transparent. The only element we couldn't provide is, let's say, the sensitivities. Uh, but to some extent, uh, giving uh, enough disclosure of our methodology, we put uh, almost everybody in a situation of assessing which banks can be more or less vulnerable because they can see starting points, impact of the relief measures and uh, exposures towards uh, uh, the most affected sectors and countries. 
um, and I would say in a more general terms, uh, I think uh, uh, supervisors are now requested to be more accountable. And as Steele was, was saying, we spoiled, uh, let's say, the customer, so we cannot really go back uh, to the past. I think we don't want and we cannot. And I would say more generally in the uh, post bail-in framework in which it's important to understand uh, where banks are in terms of capital position because of the MDA, you cannot be opaque uh, as uh, sometimes supervisors were in the past. So there is no going back in that respect. On the sovereign, I think we also have some uh, elements of this in our report. What we, I mean, and, and we say that this is of course one of the uh, vulnerabilities for, for banks. There are around three trillion of uh, sovereign uh, bonds in banks' balance sheets. Uh, around uh, slightly more than 40% are uh, mark to market, so at fair value. So the impact is uh, immediate to the, to the capital position of banks. And I think um, more than 45% are uh, bonds with a maturity uh, with, uh, uh, of five or more uh, years, so more sensitive to the widening of the, of the spreads. So of course, this is a, an area of concern. At the same time, it is also true that again, the, the ECB is playing a, a significant role in, 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 managing, in managing this risk. Um, perhaps if I may, but very quickly on, the, on what um, Veronique was mentioning on the buffers and the usability of the buffers, I think was very interesting what she said uh, in terms of having, let's say, more CCYB and less uh, what she calls MDA buffers, which are, let's say, more structural buffers like the capital conservation, systemic risk buffer and the others, which to some extent are, let's say, more structural buffers, which is a bit of an oxymoron because again, they cannot be really used. Um, so I agree with her. My only question, but probably for a next, uh, uh, for a next uh, seminar is uh, whether the beauty contest is more driven by the MDA itself or is more just banks uh, not willing to see solvency ratios to go, uh, to go down? Because in this case, it's not something you can really solve uh, in a different design of the buffers. Thank you. Veronique? Okay, then maybe we go to Nicola and then we come back to Veronica. I'm sorry. Oh, no, okay, she's back. Okay, please. Okay, sorry. sorry. Uh, both uh, audio and video, sorry. Um, yes, um, uh, Mario, I will be delighted to continue the discussion on the buffer, maybe separately. Uh, on consolidation, um, form of consolidation is happening, but maybe not the consolidation that is the most needed. If you start from the point of view that Europe is overbanked, uh, there are too many banks and branches around because you know, given the, the changes in behavior of our clients and digitalization, frankly, we don't need those branches anymore. Um, it's a challenge from an organic standpoint. I, each bank is, is in the process of reducing the number of branches and certainly the, the confinement can only accelerate that, that process. So why would you uh, take the burden of buying another retail bank or, or, or universal bank with a large network uh, just to, to put on, on yourself the burden, both, both operationally and also politically and socially, to reduce the number, of, to close the branches, basically. So I think the, the disincentive for uh, full-fledged mergers uh, of banks is, is, is not so much regulatory, especially in terms of medium-sized banks, but it's structural um, just because it doesn't make sense. Now, what's happening in terms of consolidation is different. It is some banks wanted to um, refocus on their core business and therefore reducing uh, non-strategic businesses. And that can be selling subsidiaries, like, I don't know, an asset management subsidiary that has occurred already largely, but we still see some th those kind of transactions happening, or even selling portfolios. Just you know, it's public uh, that uh, BNP Paribas has recently bought the, the, the prime brokerage business from Deutsche Bank. This is not a consolidation, but it's a consolidation of market share, if you like. It's not a consolidation as, as we, it's not an M&A transa transaction, but at the end of the day, it does consolidate the market share. Is that positive? Is this kind of, of consolidation positive? You, you might argue, I'm sure Nicola would argue that, that this actually creates more vulnerability because it, it's more concentrating uh, potentially volatile business in, in fewer hands. But at the same time, the cost of running a CID business is such both, both technically and regulatory um, that only a few players can, 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 can play it. And uh, sometimes I hear that, you know, uh, 
uh, we, it would be nice if middle-sized banks would be developing more capital market uh, businesses in the context of capital market union, for example. I think that's a total dream because it is really very tough and very costly. So uh, I, that's what I see in consolidation. Now, the, the COVID-specific measures, if anything, can only further slow down the, the process because it means that the relief provided is going to help everybody the better and, 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 and the most vulnerable banks. I, I was interested by Mario's comment saying that maybe the most vulnerable were not those that were benefiting from the measures. I, I, I have a doubt, I, I, have a doubt. I mean, I, I don't know, uh, it would be interesting to hear him on why that this would be, but the way we see it is that, you know, the more, more favorable treatment of NPLs and so on and so forth is, is there for everybody, um, and especially those with weaker portfolios, I would say. Nicola. Yeah, the first thing I uh, would like to say, uh, and this echoes the comments on disclosure, is that uh, we have been used, and that was, I think, very apt in the previous crisis, particularly in 2008, 2009, to look up to the U.S. for inspiration, uh, because the U.S. clearly had better uh, crisis management policies than the Eurozone. I think that era is over. At this point, uh, there are things that the Eurozone is already doing better than the U.S. in terms of crisis response. And I think we'll see more of that going forward. Uh, the recent initiatives by the Fed uh, have been, I think, very disappointing. Uh, I encourage you to read the blog post by Dan Parullo on the stress test results, which is on the Brookings website, uh, and which I think has a very uh, complete analysis of uh, these shortcomings. So, so at this point, I would certainly not go for, you know, is the US, if the Fed is doing something that must be right, uh, and that goes for supervisory transparency. If you, if you remember Tim Geithner's book, he describes in detail the internal debates at the Fed uh, before the stress test of 2009, and that many people within the House didn't want to disclose bank by bank results, and Geithner insisted for that, and he was right, and that has been the stance for the last decade. But now we are apparently seeing a reversal uh, in terms of the Fed's stance on supervisory transparency, which I think is very bad for the US, but for us Europeans means we shouldn't look at them uh, necessarily for inspiration. On your question, uh, Elena, uh, fragmentation, uh, doom loop and all that. I mean, obviously the current level of spreads uh, are very sustainable. Uh, that has to be monitored, uh, but I think the combination of ECB leadership and political leadership, assuming of course that the discussion about next generation EU go somewhere, which I think is the baseline assumption right now, should get us uh, outside of the uh, nightmare scenario of a revival of um, the bank sovereign vicious circle. Of course, as that requires continuous attention from policymakers, and it's only a hypothesis, and, and, and I'm certainly not pleading complacency. But if that hypothesis uh, as a baseline is correct, that means that uh, sovereign exposures are not the biggest issue right now, even so I'm on record insisting on the centrality of sovereign exposures. And I think frankly, banks at this point should diversify their sovereign exposures. And I would not view it as negatively if the ECB was uh, encouraging them to do so. But, um, but, but I don't think that's the main uh, problem now. Now in terms of completing the banking union, I think we have to be realistic. Heavy duty legislative reform is not something you do in the midst of a crisis. So we can do things like the CRR quick fix, and I actually agree with Veronique on that, that it would be better if it was in the hands of the uh, authorities and not the legislator, because we need that kind of flexibility as a matter of principle. But in terms of making resolution work, uh, which currently the BRD resolution regime doesn't, um, and in terms of dealing in a legislative and structural way with the problem of structural exposures, and of course, in terms of creating a European uh, deposit insurance uh, scheme uh, or system, I think all these things which are absolutely necessary medium to long term for the Eurozone cannot be done in the midst of the current turmoil. So essentially we have to think of different time horizons. We have to think of the lessons we will learn from whatever uh, you know, uh, outcome we have of this episode in two, three years time in terms of next steps of reform and completing the banking union. But at this point, I think we have to think very much into the framework of the current legislative framework. And that's why ESM uh, direct precautionary recapitalization, for example, is very uh, relevant because it doesn't require uh, legislative changes. It requires, of course, 
ESM decision, which, uh, you know, unanimity and the kind of decision making they have, but no change in legislation. So, so basically, this is a bit of a frustrating message I have, which is don't try to fix the engine uh, in the midst of the race. Uh, you have to deal with the legislation you have. Very good. Till, last word. I'm, I'm conscious that we are terribly over time, so please. Was your question about the credibility of a backstop, such as there might be? Yes, yes. So the fact um, that if we don't have a, such a credible backstop in Europe, at least not yet, to which extent can we really think of doing stress tests in a situation of crisis as the one we have? Well, I, mean, I think this is a really key question in the crisis. <clears throat> you know, if, if there's no credible backstop, be careful about what you find when you do a really serious stress test, which of course was the case, uh, you know, the early stress tests in, in, in Europe that found almost no capital need back in 2010 and 2011. Um, you know, the EU is in better situation now than they were uh, before. We're in the US in a worse situation than we were before. Um, you know, let's hope the backstop is still credible. Uh, and, the expectation is that the deficit uh, is going to be, not the debt, the deficit is going to be about 24% uh, percent of GDP this year at the rate that we're going. Uh, and so we'll, we'll hope, hopefully the backstop will remain credible <laughs> and that we don't need it. But um, I think an important observation is we're going into this in the U.S. worse and from that perspective than last prices, uh, but the EU is probably going into it better than the last prices. Let's hope so. And with this positive note, I think we really need to close the webinar. I'm sorry, I would have loved to continue this discussion. So let me thank all of you for very interesting remarks and for the discussion and to Mario in particular for suggesting that we would do this webinar on this EBA assessment. So thanks a lot. We will give you all the questions, but we most more or less covered all of them. And thanks for this participant that stayed the numerous until the end. Thank you and to the next occasion. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.